The scout runs up to your party, out of breath. It's green! If you're unlucky, you should leave and say, It's a dragon! No, you would assume it's a green dragon, right? If you do, then the only green one around here is you. I could name dozens of green draconic creatures, and that's not even touching the ones that are half green or bluish green. Now, we're gonna have to split it into multiple parts because of that, and if you're thinking I'm gonna do it by power or dragonkin versus dragons, wrong again. We're going with a forest focus. That way you can get something out of this episode no matter what your power level. So settle in, class, because if someone says dragon, we need to ask more questions. Oh, and the first thing I want to make clear is that while I'm covering multiple editions and systems, anything that's not in Pathfinder 2e or D&D 5e will have appropriate homebrew. They'll be on the screen and in the description, so whatever you're doing, I gotcha. Anyway, the easiest things to get out of someone are color, location, size, and number of limbs. I'm going to assume we know the biome we're standing in or headed to, so next we look at size. We're talking the size of a cat, a person, a horse, a house? Remember, most people aren't going to know that your average hatchling is the size of a halfling, often bigger, so if we're talking really little, it's probably not actually a baby. Depending on the age and location, the bay dragonette or fairy dragon can be any color. They're a cat-sized dragonkin from the world of Fae, playing in areas where the line between here and there is weak, just like them. The fairy dragon starts at CR1 and grows to CR2, while the fae dragonette starts at CR2 but can supposedly get as strong as a real dragon if they live long enough. They both have innate magic for illusions, can turn themselves invisible, and have some form of telepathy. They're both quite similar, but have some unique traits in their interpretations. In Pathfinder, the breath can slow and stupefy with a difficult save, and their magic is area control like grease or sleep or tangle plant. The only hostile spell they have is just throwing things at you. The D&D version, on the other hand, has a baked-in magic resistance, and their breath causes a confusion effect to randomize your actions. Their invisibility is also at will and nearly constant, but their telepathy only works on other fairy dragons, and only the strongest have magic other than illusions. Now, one thing unique to D&D is that in their lair, they can redirect missed ranged attacks and cause difficult terrain by animating plants, which is pretty cool and different, but I figured we'd start with one where they're still pretty similar. Now, if it gets any bigger than this, we'll have to ask the second question. How many limbs? Because it might be a drake. And I mean a real drake, not a dinosaur. Apparently in dino-heavy areas, locals do usually call them drakes. I mean, I guess it makes sense when you think about it. Your average farmer doesn't really care about all the minute differences between drakes and reptiles. It's big, scaly, and eating their cow, and that's all they really need to know. But there's a few different body types for real drakes. The medium-sized ones are all on the four-legged wingless camp. Now, you might remember guard drakes from the Red Dragon video. They're like draconic guard dogs that dragons make with a pound of fresh scales in a ritual. Basically, Pathfinder's riding drake, but without the breath weapon. They're not that dangerous, but since they can't breed, they're a sign of powerful dragon activity. But for green, we also need to mention ambush drakes, which are kind of like draconic wolves. They're five foot long pack hunters that make communal hordes. In older editions, they could also glide and breathe poison gas and resist magic and have telepathy. Those would terrorize the plains, but 5e just made them bulky poison resistant wolves. But don't worry, I returned them to their former glory. But enough of this human sized stuff, let's get into the meat of things. Big dragon with many trees. The ones with the most tree would be in the jungle. For D&D's favorite four legged no wing type, we look at the landworm from third edition. These were all extremely dangerous challenge 13 creatures that knew, and I quote, no emotion except for hate which it holds for all creatures. They're huge, clever, and often mistaken for dinosaurs. Or green dragons I presume, which are about the only creatures that even phase them, assuming they're old enough. They're ambush predators, like most of our subjects today, I guess because they all blend in. This one acts a little weird though, running in and attacking everyone in the group before disappearing. That's because their claws have red ache disease, sapping your strength for when they come back later. Makes a god they're only mentioned once in the Draconomicon. Even the wiki doesn't have anything on them. Too bad I'm bringing them back. But most of you could probably use something tamer, like Pathfinder's Jungle Drake. This is your two wing, two leg body plan. They are far weaker at level six, but they've got it all. Surges of speed, explosions of venomous phlegm, a venomous stinger on their tail. My favorite part's their predatory grab. They're masters of dragging people away at full speed. These hit and run tactics only get better when they group up in a rampage and gang up on parties to drag them in different directions. Even if there's fewer drakes than people, you still have to split up or figure out who you like least. Pathfinder drakes are basically here to fill that niche of wanting a dragon, but the party's too weak. Drakes still sell for a good chunk of coin where it's not considered slavery, but they aren't exactly known for their reason or conversation. I mean, no offense, but look at the Pathfinder 1 forest drake and tell me you see scheming mastermind. By the way, this picture is why I call them dragon chickens. This isn't a forest menace, this is Kazooie when you open the ice safe in Banjo-Tooie. They're still probably my favorite though, they just look so goofy. They're a bit weaker and don't have a venomous stinger, but they are amphibious. Their breath is an acid cloud, and I just want to say that I love how Pathfinder does their breath weapons. Dragons have lines and cones, drakes have explosions. Quite literally spitting out a random elemental burst. Makes them different and more crass than dragons while still keeping that power. Forest ones are even more brutish than most, these level 4 grunts are just bullies. I mean, they're still dangerous in a group, they'll eat bay and elves, but they mostly just squat in caves and run away if they're shown force. A far cry from the cruel cunning of the jungle or intelligent hatred of the landworms. Speaking of landworms, the forest ones are the opposite of their cousins. They're noble woodland protectors, a much more manageable CR-10, and hunt down anyone who hunts more than they need. Even better is that the forest itself knows this and respects it. It can talk with nature and see right through natural concealment. The trees just refuse to help you hide. I also love the detail that their scales change in autumn to match the leaves. And fall, these things must be gorgeous. Now, I think the best part is that they honestly aren't that good at their job. Like, they'll drive out humanoids, but also animals and 
and bugs if they're too predatory. I guess they only really care about the trees? And the gnomes, who have sufficiently convinced them that they live in harmony with nature. Only gnomes though, not elves. As far as they're concerned, elves are the enemies of the woods. They'll chase away wildcats as scourge of the forest, but defend the gnome village with pride. I mean, as funny as that is, you do have to convince it you're no threat when you pass through, or it will kill you. And they can come from any direction with digging and climbing, at least when the tree can support a horse-sized dragon. I love that since they're relatively small for a dragon, they actually have a frill to seem bigger. Like, that's gonna work on anything actually strong enough to be a threat to them. But it is nice to see a plant dragon be good, give you a chance to talk and compromise instead of just killing you. Actually, screw it, let's go one step further. How about a drake that wants you in its woods? One here to teach people to live in harmony instead of just kicking out exclusively the people who are too tall to do so literally. The campfire drake is a combination of scoutmaster and park warden. They protect the wilderness, harassing those who overhunt or pollute or harm the wilds. But if you're willing to learn how to live in harmony, they'll happily teach you. They'll make them fairly weak, but they form a community with pretty much anyone. Little enclaves of rangers and such, but ready to help a hurting hiker or offer shelter to travelers. I could see them making little backcountry hunts for anyone passing through. And of course, we have to give them some thematic abilities. Their breath weapon could be a cloud of burning embers, and they have a burrow speed to help with rock balls. We'll add a fire starter on their tail, a few magical tricks for tying knots and controlling insects, and of course, the ability to quench fires. I can imagine them mostly being reclusive protectors, but a few are chipper wilderness guides ranting about fire safety to anyone willing to listen. But if more tree means more evil, does less tree make Lindworm less evil? Absolutely not. Especially since I didn't say landworm, I said lindworm, also known as the norm. And even stronger than the jungle landworm in power and malice is the tiger Lenorm. And if you don't know what a Lenorm is, oh, you're in for a treat if you love nasty surprises. These are dragons of the north that you get in things like the Poetic Edda. Nidhogg, Fafnir, the kind that are two legs shy of a snake. I guess that kindness must be stored in the hind legs. These primeval dragons hate all lesser creatures and love causing suffering. And take note of that, because there's tales of gaining one's respect by beating it into submission. And they usually have enough respect for other Lenorms to not go on their turf. These 70 foot long terrors are rare partially because our world is too small and limiting. And they've got some tricks beyond just biting hard. They're lightning dragons, breathing clouds of electrified mist. They're also venomous, which drains your energy because the venom is also lightning. Their bristling spines stab anyone who stabs them, and they don't need them to fly. They're actually even faster while flying with magic to make sure you can't even slow them down. Well, let's say you do manage to stop this level 19 creature. You bust out the cold iron to turn off its regeneration. You don't let it grab you and fly off. Congratulations, you get to make an extremely difficult will save. What, did you think that death could stop an actual legend? Make a save or have fun with your new major weakness to lightning. And it's permanent too. They always get the last laugh. But hey, look on the bright side. This was one of the easiest curses. I can't wait to get to the real ones. But in actual good news, in most regions you find these, beating a full-grown Lenorm is claimed to a throne. At this point, you're nearly max level anyway, just retire. But now let's add a few more legs and get back to more temperate woods with a normal dragon. That's right, no more beating around the bush or talking about the bush. We can talk about this in mock another time. You're here for a true, normal, green forest dwelling dragon with an incredibly uncreative name. And while that does actually describe three of them, I think it's best to talk about green dragons first. I'm gonna use them as the baseline, then pivot to what I think is an equally interesting twist with a horn and a better design with Boris. Because spoilers, I think it's a masterclass, but I think it'll help you understand why if you know where they're coming from. So first, we start with green. These are poison ones, and D&D breathing specifically chlorine gas. Now that's kind of strange because chlorine comes from seawater and dried up seas, not the forest they live in, but in a way that's kind of fitting. These are corruptors, the snow death of mind and body, and what chokes out plant life like salt. They love manipulation, and while they aren't the most clever, they are the best at putting that wit to use. They're persistent, stalking prey for days to slowly wear them down, and always leaving a survivor to spread their tail. That patience leads to century-long schemes, letting them take down much bigger rivals. Not to even mention kingdoms, especially elves who are their favorite victim. Honestly, they have most of the best dragon stories. Like old Nabon. She disguised herself as a silver dragon, offered to kill her for a fee, stole the reward that was gathered, staged her own defeat with illusions, took the new reward, came back as herself, took the rest of his stuff for daring to hire an assassin, killed most of his family when he tried to stall to call a dragon slayer, and when Waterdeep finally showed up to put her down, just so happened to be right when a rival green dragon showed up to take her territory. She gets off scot-free because they thought he was her. Now speaking of taking stuff, at home their hordes are mostly art, gems, powerful people as proof of their skill, and rare plants. They're just great at cultivating plants in general. Their latent magic just makes them grow better. And if they can't get their preferred lair in high cliffs behind waterfalls, they'll just raise huge thickets as defenses for their lair. Tracking an older one is also pretty much impossible. They'll bend nature to their will and fill the forest with mazes. And you have to see through the fog that fills their forest, the chlorinated haze of their lair, and the magical, charming fog that they can summon. But that's getting into abilities, and as you may have noticed, we've only covered D&D. That's because with this dragon, they only took influence from their mechanics. They both got their claws and bites and tail attacks, they supernaturally frighten anyone who's near, they breathe poison, they're amphibious, and they can both snap you even when it's not their turn. The D&D version has extra bulk, legendary resistance, and incredible con. It's like trying to kill a weed that hates you, and if you catch it in its lair, they summon massive balls of thorns, animate bodies like puppets, grab you with roots and vines, and fill the area with a magic bog that can charm you. Even on your turn, they can move around while knocking you prone. There's even the rare caster 
Kuru knows how to use illusions and plant growth and speak with animals, though it's honestly a bit redundant since older ones can see through the eyes of animals anyway. Pathfinder ones, however, take it a different direction. They've got high strength and AC, but most of their other stats are pretty low. And even with a plus one against magic, their saves are honestly pretty mid. But where they thrive is absurd damage. This isn't a vine creeping up your wall, it's a tree falling through your roof. Their already decent poison breath surrounds them in a fog cloud only they can see through. It also hits you on your turn and completely disrupts whatever you are doing. It deals extra poison damage on an already strong bite, assuming it doesn't just swipe twice and stab you with a torn, which it probably will because it gets its breath weapon back on a crit, letting it make even more poison fog. And not only can they not be tracked, they also can't be stomped, so they barrel through the forest typical terrain. And the best part is that, unlike their counterparts, magic isn't rare. Everyone can make tangling binds and magic charm, the strongest getting straight up magical domination, and that's if they aren't a spellcaster, which most are, at which point they typically go for spells like illusions, shapeshifting into humans, teleportation, and contingency. Yeah, they've got the occasional cloud kill or spell reflection, but it's mostly utility and defense. I know it's making them sound like an angry freight train, and don't get me wrong, if you mess with them you're dead, but these are hermetic scholars. They're diplomatic like the others, but they crave isolation and quiet. The forest isn't just a hostile extension of themselves, it's their pride. They preserve and cultivate it, though it's rarely in the druidic sense. They lean towards arcane secrets and occult lore, finding a topic of interest and delving hard. They're mostly diplomatic so they can write other scholars to trade secrets, so they mostly stick with academics and professionals because they have a little time for anyone not on their level. They aren't exactly trying to improve the field though, it's because they're obsessed with self-discipline and want to improve themselves. It's this thirst for knowledge that makes them keep libraries and museums and forest caves, and lets adventurers survive an encounter by beating at lost Norn, stroking its ego. These might also breed rare plants, but the pride's not from the rarity, it's from discovering new secrets. You also might have noticed a difference in their fighting style. Green dragons are charming their opponent and using the environment in clever ways, they're manipulators. Even on your turn, they're moving around and controlling the flow of battle, and again, they'll run if they get hurt and just harass the party for days. They're a patient, creeping poison that will slowly cloud your mind and world and break you down, and they'll enjoy every moment like a toxin flowing through your veins. But the Pathfinder Dragon is a precise and focused strike. It's darting in to hit hard, fast, and repeatedly. Its abilities keep their actions unknowable and remove any obstacle to its progress. They're also filled with magic that's great for gathering more information and keeping others away. They aren't nature as insidious creeping terror, their nature is in fuck around and find out and paled on their horn. Oh wait, sorry, no, that's the horn dragon. They're totally different from the green ones, just look at them. Yeah, they're the only main D&D dragon that were changed so much anyway, they just gave them a new name. I mean, I guess they also changed the spells a little, made them a bit more offensive with desiccate and execute, but they've still got mostly plant and privacy spells. But now let's finally take a look at the forest dragon. They're one of those leggy noodles. Nature is in a natural disaster here to get you off its lawn. They guard nature and reclaim ruins for the wilderness. There's also an interesting twist of hoarding nature's power, even considering druids and herbalists to basically just be stealing nature's might. As they age, they even turn into their forest by growing moss and becoming woody with animals living in them. All of the imperial dragons are known for delving in humanoid affairs, and in this case, it is really antagonistically. It might not be corrupting an elven king or making a mystical library, but look at the themes. The horned dragon is like a noble beast, the fury of fauna and the fear of the wilderness adapting right back. Green dragons speak of nature's ever-present poisons, being watched and followed and slowly ground down. They're insidious, clouding your mind in the air itself until you're at its mercy. And its mercy is you being useful, most commonly by being consumed. I think that's fantastic, but where forest dragons haven't been is that I can make the woods winding and full of fog myself. The fear of a predator stalking them is so easy I can do it without there even being a monster. And don't get me wrong, poison is scary, but here the forest is more than just the wind-up. It wraps you and crushes you like nature does to everything we create. It has a draining bite that heals itself by ripping the life out of everything around like cudsing. Its breath releases swarms of venomous insects, and if it kills you with its bite, the wood will consume you and replace your flesh like it was dirt. Its magic lets it turn into plants or lash out with a forest itself, and water lets it quickly regrow. However, fire and metal are forever our tools against the forest. Fire deals extra damage, and metal clears a path. Getting hit with metal will turn off any ability to hide or move through the woods, at least until it gets a moment to recover. Now don't get me wrong, these powers are also just really cool in a fight. And while the stat block is big, most of is single use or passive. But what I love most is that this is a forest dragon. It's not just a big magical incarnation of scary things in the woods, it is the woods and that is more than enough danger. Now I was gonna end here, but I remembered you probably want to use these things, or at least know how to fight them. So let's look at their lifestyle, because unlike most, there's not really a point in going age by age. Even D&D people are unlikely to fight a wormling, because green dragons are the best chromatic parents, staying together to raise them for 50 years. These are the only dragons ready to fight and die for their young. It's also why they're the only one that rarely betrays their parents, even if the relationship ends when they leave. So if you find one, watch out for the parent. And if it's an orphan 
weapon or escaped kidnapped egg, your biggest foe is still gonna be whatever it's manipulating. They'll try to run or bargain with the party at the first opportunity, but honestly, there's not much reason for them to fight. They're even omnivores, so chances are that if it hunted livestock, it's not gonna be something that was missed. There's just no conflict unless they're mature. If you are hunting a green dragon, however, it should probably be the final battle of an arc. Their agents and minions have been causing trouble, and after hunting them down one by one, you finally uncover the villain behind it all. You should see this dragon at least once, stalking you and listening to you when you think you're alone. It should dart in, bite for a round or two, then disappear into the woods. I wouldn't recommend it doing that directly more than once or twice, not just for annoyance sake, but for drama's sake. If it keeps showing up, they're gonna land a lucky crit or two. Unless that's what you want, of course, turning its lair into a treasure hunt with another guardian inside. Maybe even its mate, but I recommend you just have every attempt to navigate the forest end with something it's set up. Balling logs, redirecting a stream into camp, distant chuckling as minions appear or plant monsters form. This also just works great as a traveling encounter for people passing through the woods. Maybe that's why they're hunting the dragon. They've gone through this road a dozen times and they're sick of it messing with them. But no matter what, don't forget the minions. Especially once they track down the dragon in their waterfall lair. The inside will be covered in twisting vines and mazes of corridors. Dragons always have traps and attract kobolds, but green ones also like goblins and edder caps and even giant kin like Etten. I would recommend having the minions influence whatever you put in the dungeon, but I suggest leaning in on plant life. A pits of poisonous plants, adventure or fly traps, an iron golem made from specially treated wood. Maybe there's Yanti hiding in the vines, or a different adventuring party made of failed dragon slayers. And you gotta have vine ridden undead, where older ones have a chlorine haze that gets stronger as they go down. And once they find that final chamber, have it be filled with curtains of roots and pools of water. If the party starts going down easy, it might not be too late to offer services, but if they're too strong, it will try to run. Now in my experience, the party rarely lets that happen, but there's hardly a better vengeful dragon for manipulating an even bigger threat to come after him. Horn dragons, however, are far more simple. They probably track the party down to make him useful or tell him to leave. These ones are a lot more open to talking, but also hate having their time wasted. So as long as the party listens to them, they're probably good. Otherwise, it's probably gonna stab someone to death, as impaling someone is one of their favorite ways to make the point clear. The party might also just not be wanting violence. They might just be looking to trade information for spell scrolls or something. If they are looking for a fight, though, I would run these utilitarian. It'll start with things like snares and pitfalls and cages to weed out prey and potential scholars, then things like falling rocks or even just a magical alarm that goes off if you open their massive door too slowly. Inside its lair's main portion, try to make the hazards be part of their interest. An herbalist might have pitcher plant pitfalls. A dictionologist hasn't finished cleaning up hagfish slime for their floors. And maybe an astronomer can use swiveling mirrors to blind. Make it the dream of any scientist with the money and power for the facility of their dreams, because that's basically what they are. Again, though, quick and efficient in a fight. Impaling someone then flying away is a terrifying combo. It can isolate anyone and make escaping the grapple become deadly. And I would interpret that self-discipline as not getting caught up in rage. If it thinks it might lose, it's gonna run and prepare for a better strike later when they sleep. After all, if it's in the forest, it can't be tracked and has a speed advantage. Now, funnily enough, the one with the most complicated sap block is also the easiest to prep for. With the forest dragon, whether it found you or you found it really doesn't matter much. I'm not sure they even have a typical lair. They don't seem to hoard anything other than nature. Apparently some are casters, learning magic to spread disease, turn people into animals, make natural walls, and plenty of offense. Like gripping all the water out of your body or making you implode. They don't mess around. I mean, we know they make nests to hatch eggs, but honestly, I assume their territory is their lair and they sleep wherever they want. Maybe have it take the ruins of a city it destroyed or a forest cave for shelter? The point is that there's honestly nothing here to trap. No gauntlet outside the forest itself. However, that doesn't mean the battlefield has to be boring. Have the first round start off with a stampede of animals running away in terror. Or maybe it could shake some out as it moves. Have the land be full of natural pitfalls or make sure to engage with the parties back to a river. The older ones could have the ground shake beneath them when they make a bull dash. Though honestly, these ones are pretty complex even without a super intricate battlefield. But that's all three and you're probably expecting some sort of big homebrew dragon here. I did too and I had a few ideas, but believe it or not, I do know my limit. I mean, I better. I do spend most of my time straining against it. All of these are a giant reminder of the terror of nature. But how about a creature of bounty? Something weak but beloved. How about an orchard dragonette? They're tiny, tending bushes or maybe a garden. They can help plant grow, distribute water, make sure the ground stays fertile. But when they work with people who give them love and care, they start to grow. Then you get these magnificent forests and fields that look less like orchards and more like a land of plenty. They're happy to share with anyone who respects nature or wants to help, but otherwise defend it fiercely with a fan elves they bonded with. And thankfully, usually, that's where the tale ends. Though there is a rumor of a rare third stage. They might have turned to greed, but they probably just cared too much about more people than they could sustain. So their field becomes the most densely packed and nutrient-rich area imaginable, themselves as strong as an actual dragon. But they will get out of control, and while their field thrives, everything around them will start to suffer. Now you can counteract it with special care, they aren't trying to hurt anyone. But if that sounds interesting, I'll leave this one up to you. Like I said, they're made by others wanting more than they can give. But I think that'll do it. My throat is dying. Partially because I got started while drinking my tea and scalded my nose. But if you'd like to help me get more tea and coffee to replace that, my coffee link is in the description. That was a horrible segue, but it really does help. I just received a new microphone thanks to Feral Goblin, Level 1 Cleric, Snake Oil, Modern Masquerade, and Dr. Mug. Thank you so much, because as I'm recording this, I just noticed the mute button.
button doesn't work anymore. When I said this was glued together, I was not kidding. Our next goal was going to be upgrading my system, but I bought my bed with my very first paycheck and it is really starting to feel that way. It's not unusable yet, but it's headed that direction and I can work a lot quicker on a good night's sleep. Anyway, I'm just rambling at this point, so thanks for watching and class dismissed!